Good morning, everyone. And welcome to worship with the community of the First Parish in Lincoln. We are so glad that you are here today, you who are here in person and those of you who are at home and on Zoom. We welcome you all. Our roots go back to the 1740s, believe it or not, and our present community was formed in 1942 by the coming together of the Congregational and the Unitarian churches in town. We try to be welcoming and inclusive and encompass a wide range of theological and spiritual beliefs. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever you carry with you in your heart, please know that you are very welcome here with us today. We will also want to thank Nancy Henderson for the beautiful bouquet of flowers that you see up on the altar here. And we invite you to put your prayers in the chat and we will read them during our community prayer time. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we deepen into worship with our opening words found in your order of service. Look to this day. For it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence. The bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of for yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness. And every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. And now would you join together in singing our opening hymn found in the gray hymnal, number 126, Come, Thou Font of Every Blessing.
Would you all join with me, please, as together we adopt an attitude of prayer. Fount of blessing, spirit of life, you have brought us to this day, this unlikely, exciting day that reminds us just how unlikely and exciting our brief time here on earth really is. We gather today after months and years of preparation, of active listening roundtables, of profiles written and read, of seasons of humility, seasons of transformation. So, God of love, as we raise our voices and our votes today, walk beside us, we pray. If any of us are feeling any butterflies, Help us to slow down and breathe. And in this body where every member has one vote, grant each of us a spirit of generosity and respect towards our neighbor. And lastly, may your voice, that still small voice, that call to care for the least of these, to cherish and protect the living earth, May that be the voice that we listen for this morning as we seek to become a community that abounds with joy where everyone has a name, a home, and a calling. Amen. Amen. And if you would, join me now in our... Covenant. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. And now I would love to invite all the children of the church who are here today to come join me up front. You might be wondering, like, who this guy is and what I'm doing up here, and that's going to be what we're going to talk about today. So come on up and, and join me on one of these steps up here. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Welcome, welcome. So I met you guys a little bit on Friday. And what I wanna talk to you about today is two words that are closely related but a little bit different. The first word is call, and the second word is calling. But first I have a question for you. Can somebody tell me what this is? Can somebody tell me what this is? Yes, it is a phone, it is a phone. And we recently got a swing set in our house and this came attached to it and I was so interested in it. And I'm just wondering, you guys think about what kinds of phones you have at your houses. Does anybody have like a phone like this that you actually have to hang on the wall? You do? Have you ever used it? And it still works? And <laughs> it doesn't work? Oh my goodness. Well. Can you guys believe like when I was your age, every phone, we had to make a call, every phone kind of looked like this and it hung on the wall and then sometimes even it had a cord attached to it so you could, you had to kind of stay close by to the wall and then the cord would pull you back. That's how hard it was to make a call and maybe even some of us back in the day, there, there was like one telephone in our house. Way back in the day here in Lincoln, there was probably only one or two telephones in the whole town and people had to line up when they wanted to make a call. I was also thinking about a show that we watch sometimes in our house called Paw Patrol. Does anybody, does, does anybody know Paw Patrol? Well, what happens at the beginning of every episode? Somebody gets in trouble, or there's a, there's a sticky kind of situation, and what do they do? They call, they call, right? They call up Ryder, and he calls all the pups, and they solve the case. And they solve the case. So 
So we know calls are important. And I want to introduce this other word to you all real quick. It sounds like call, but it's callings. It's callings. And the reason why I'm here today and the reason why my wife Kit is here today is that we feel like we might have a calling to be the next ministers of this church. And the church thinks that that might be true too. And so what's going to happen after we worship together is every member of this church is going to vote. Everybody's going to vote and that's the way, that's the way we're going to figure out if this calling is real. Now you guys might be wondering like what does a calling have to do with me? And I wonder if you've ever had to make like a hard decision in your life. Have you ever had to make a hard decision like maybe you've had to decide like what summer camp you want to go to or even we're going to have some cake I heard afterwards and there might be a few different kinds of cake. It might be hard to pick which one you really want to eat. And as you grow older, right, you you know this, there's going to be more and more decisions in your life. You're going to get to decide maybe where you want to go for school and maybe who you want to spend your time with and what kind of work you want to do. And what happens sometimes, and it is so amazing, sometimes we hear this voice. We hear a voice and And sometimes it feels like it comes from inside of us, and sometimes it feels like it it comes from way far outside. And that voice helps us figure out how we should be living, what we should be doing. So that's kind of what we mean when we say calling. And, And Kit and I, we felt a calling to become ministers, and it has brought us to these different churches all across the country. We've met some really amazing people. And I am so curious and excited to see where your callings are going to take you all in your lives. So let's just end today by saying a quick prayer together. And to remember call and calling and how they're connected, I just invite you to put your hand up. Kind of see how I'm doing. Pretend you have a little phone in your hand. Put your hand up while we pray. Because so much of calling is about listening, too. So we're just going to take a quick moment of silence and do a little listening, and then I'll say a prayer. Loving Spirit, we thank you for these children. Help us to listen for your voice and keep guiding each and every one of us. We pray in your many names. Amen. I was being instructed that we got to make sure that phone makes its way back to our swing set or we're in trouble. (laughs) Good morning, everyone. For our first reading today, we have selected a brief but somewhat famous poetic passage from perhaps a more obscure story out of the Hebrew Bible. We'll get to some more context later. But it's, uh, it's the story of the prophet Elijah who gets into some drama with Queen Jezebel. And when we encounter him here, he's come to the end of his rope. He is feeling down and out and all alone. Has anyone ever found yourself feeling that way? Yeah. And he, Elijah, he's gotten really used to God showing up in big, flashy, dramatic flourishes. But in this moment, he is surprised at a very different way, the holy shows up. So let us listen together for the spirit to speak through the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. And this is the old school King James Version. 
And the voice said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains. We got some wind in here. (laughs) And break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We come now to the time in our service which we set aside for silent and spoken prayer. To prepare ourselves, remaining seated, we will sing the first three verses of hymn number 100 in the gray hymnal. Following the hymn, we will take two minutes for silent prayer, meditation, and reflection, followed by a time for spoken prayers from the congregation.
And now, if you would like to share a spoken prayer, one of the ministers will bring you a microphone. Raise your hand, please. I would like to offer a prayer <clears throat> for my dear friend, Bobby Reardon, <clears throat> who ended his struggle with alcoholism <clears throat> and took his own life uh, at this time last year. I would like to pray that his soul is in heaven. <clears throat> Pray that those who are waging war on the civilians of Ukraine be struck with a stroke of conscience and cease this senseless slaughter. And I have one share from chat from Joan Shannon Kimball. Prayers for Mother Earth and all her species, for all new life, for our congregation and Kit and Nate on this important day, and for all those who are suffering around the world. Peace. In the spirit of the living earth, we pray that our own congregation can be like fertile ground where all of us may be nurtured and continue to grow in our individual lives and as members of the communal life that we share here. Amen. And now join me, if you will, in saying our unison prayer. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No program accomplishes the church's mission. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way an opportunity for grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of the future that is not our own. Amen.
And now will the ushers come forward, please, to receive this morning's offering. And for those on Zoom, you can support FPL by mailing your contribution to the First Parish Lincoln, Box 6218 or 14 Bedford Road, Lincoln 01773. Dear Lord, we give thanks for both these gifts and the givers, and we ask that we may use these gifts wisely and well, both to nurture the life of this congregation and to further the goals of justice and peace throughout the world. Amen. Please be seated.
That was so beautiful and powerful. Thank you. Our second reading comes from Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer. I ran across the old Quaker saying, Let Your Life Speak. Now, let your life speak means something else to me, a meaning faithful both to the ambiguity of those words and to the complexity of my own experience. Before you tell your life what you intend to do with it, listen for what it intends to do with you. Vocation does not come from willfulness. It comes from listening. I must listen to my life and try to understand what it is truly about, quite apart from what I would like for it to be about, or my life will never represent anything real in the world, no matter how earnest my intentions. That insight is hidden in the word vocation itself, which is rooted in the Latin for voice. Vocation does not mean a goal that I pursue. It means a calling that I hear. Behind this understanding of vocation is a truth that the ego does not want to hear because it threatens the ego's turf. <laughs> Everyone has a life that is different from the eye of daily consciousness, a life that is trying to live through the eye who is its vessel. That is what the poet knows and what every wisdom tradition teaches that there is a great gulf between the way my ego wants to identify me with its protective masks and self-serving fictions and my true self. It takes time and hard experience to sense the difference between the two, to sense that running beneath the surface of the experience that I call my life, there is a deeper and truer life waiting to be acknowledged. Thanks, Nate, and thank you all. It is an honor to be here this morning. On the manifold journeys of our lives, amidst the noise of the world, how do we do it? How do we hear, and more than that, how do we actually listen for that still, small voice calling us to our path, our places, our people? One afternoon several years ago, I found myself on an ordinary kind of journey, battling traffic from one side of the East San Francisco Bay to the other. In the passenger seat was one of those beloved church saints. I think you know the type. The late, great Bernice. A remarkable woman in her 90s, Bernice was four feet ten inches of pure ebullience. Today's scripture talks about a still small voice, and for whatever reason, I heard Bernice. <laughs> Bernice had this unmistakable voice, all raspy sing song. I thought of Ber Bernice, she was small. But she certainly didn't keep still. She had a perpetual bounce and a twinkle in her eye. Bernice didn't drive much anymore those days, so I'd offered to give her a ride to visit Mitzi, her best church friend of decades, who was recovering from a stroke. Mitzi could no longer speak, but we all knew that their presence together would transcend words. And it turned out to be the last time they saw one another, on this side of the veil, anyway. Now here comes another still small voice. There's Bernice and I, combating traffic. And we plugged in the address of the assisted living facility into Google Maps. 
and the automated voice is navigating us into downtown Oakland, occasionally changing its mind about the best route to take. And as we pulled off the freeway, finally, my phone announcing, in 800 feet, take the 18th Street exit, Bernice turned to me in very sincere curiosity and said, Kit, may I ask you a uh, <clears throat> naive question? Is there someone on the other end <laughs> guiding us? Now, I tell this story in full love and respect because Bernice had an excellent sense of humor and would be laughing right along with us. In fact, she was laughing at the time. Of course, Bernice explained to me there had been a, a time not so long ago in the grand scheme when you absolutely would call someone up for directions and a real live human being would answer and get you where you needed to go. I assured Bernice that our friendly guide was, alas, an app, a computerized voice, intellig it's intelligence artificial, but the question stuck with me. Of course, Bernice's question was a technological one. Is that a real voice? But I couldn't help also hearing its theological resonance. Is there someone or something on the other end, out there, actually there, guiding us? And whether you identifies, identify those voices as as God or spirit or deep intuition, your ancestors or your deepest values. It's a question for all of us. How do we actually hear those voices, the still, small whisper of the sacred? On the journeys of our lives, how do we know when to turn? And uh, what about when there seem to be multiple routes ahead, possibilities? Or the best one keeps switching, or they all look backed up. And, and now, how about when we get lost and we need to recalculate altogether? I remember another story. My dad is here today, and he loves to tell the story of when I was a teenager just learning to drive. And this was before apps and maps, but I did have a cell phone, and I would occasionally give him a frantic call, just like Bernice had suggested, asking to be guided to where I was trying to get. And this is the best part of the story. I would say, Dad, how do you get to Route 9, or wherever it was, because I grew up around here. And he would say, very patiently, OK, well, where are you? <laughs> and in my teenage exasperation, I said, oh, never mind. To get to where we are trying to go, beloved, we need the maturity and the sense of humor to admit where we are. These questions, they matter uh, on every scale of our individual and collective lives. How to spend this one precious day, what cake to choose, as Nate was saying, to how, how we spend this one precious life. Which voices we listen to affects not only our own uh, work and relationships in the world, but how we organize our communities and our world to promote justice, peace, and flourishing, and to mend the treacherous roads of oppression and neglect. Sometimes we need to create detours and new bridges. In his lovely little book of essays that Nate just read a passage from, Let Your Life Speak, which would be a great graduation gift this time of year, but it speaks to people in all life stages. The Quaker writer Parker Palmer writes that he has come to understand vocation, not as a goal, a prize, a thing to achieve, but rather a gift to be received. Something, uh, an acceptance of the treasure of true self, he writes, that we already possess. Not a voice out there calling us to become someone else, but a voice in here calling us to be the person we were born to be, to fulfill the original selfhood gifted to us at birth. He suggests if we're floundering 
to remember who we are and whose we are, we look back at who we were as children, at what brought us deep joy and meaning, what we were drawn to. Just look at a child, a child Parker Palmer writes, they're not a blank slate or clay merely to be molded. They come out themselves fully. You could see that all the kids here on the steps and out there. They come out themselves. Palmer continues, this, this inner true self, uh, biblical faith calls it the image of God in which we were all created. Thomas Merton calls it true self. Quakers sometimes call it the inner light or that of God in every person. The humanist tradition calls it identity and integrity. The passage we heard earlier today that speaks of and in that still small voice of the holy. Uh, we heard it as still small voice, but it is variously translated as a gentle whisper or perhaps more, most closely to the original Hebrew, the sound of sheer silence. Let us listen for just a moment to the sound of silence. And I can't help but hear Simon and Garfunkel echoing, hello darkness, my old friend. Surely, as, as that song put it, you know, the people bow and pray to the neon gods we make at different altars in, in this day and age, whether the altars of achievement or approval, the altars of unbridled accumulation, this, this is the image of disconnection and aimlessness that the prophet Elijah feels called to, to work against. The song puts it, people talking without speaking, people hearing without listening. There, there isn't time to get into the colorful backstory of Elijah, but I did want to lift up that right before this moment of sheer silence, this still small voice, the prophet who feels weighed down by uh, the weight of the world, he has come to, to the end of his energy, his, his capability. His resume and his sincerity and his noble calling, they do not protect him from the chaos of the world and even to feeling utter desolation. And so in the immediately preceding passage, we, we see Elijah under a broom tree, sitting under a tree, a good place to go when you are totally overwhelmed, right? Get down on the ground under a tree. And he hears a voice. This is a voice before the still small voice. And he, right before that, he says, it is too much now, Lord. It is too much. And he actually says, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. And into that utter desolation, the voice says, not something profound about geopolitical uh, unrest, not specific tasks about who to enlist in the ministry and the leadership the first thing the voice says is, get up and eat. <laughs> Sometimes spiritual wisdom is so simple, but not always easy. And in a great, uh, perhaps, uh, synchronicity with today, the, the text we chose, there appears a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. I hope we're all having some jars of water on this hot day. And in that moment, this miraculous cake on a stone, we have the simplicity that sometimes when we are tasked with a great task ahead, when we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders, we, as the, uh, the, wisdom, the deep wisdom of the 12-step programs speak, we must and we can only begin by doing the next right thing, which is sometimes a little cake and a nap. And then right after this moment, uh, when everything seems too much, the voice says, you need to eat, otherwise it will be too much for you. And then comes this passage with earth, wind, and fire, the Bible's own soul funk disco sensation. But of course, Elijah recognizes that, that God, the holy, is not in the earth, the wind, the fire. 
but in the still, small voice, the moment afterward. Sometimes we expect uh, revelation or inspiration to come with jazz hands and special effects. This is your path here. But what if sacred callings are more like the stage hand whispering once the curtain falls? Elsewhere in the poetry of the Bible, the psalmist declares, Be still and know that I am God. And perhaps two of the most repeated refrains throughout these sacred traditions, if you're hearing an angel or a sacred messenger, it's often one of two messages. Be still and fear not. When things are too much in the world, we all need some space, space to breathe and receive. We need silence, and beloved, we need one another. And like the quiet walkers who showed Nate and I a way through the path in the forest of Lincoln on Friday afternoon, there is power in walking a path together while also having our own journey. There is solidarity and strength in having fellow travelers. And as Nate and I listened for the small, still voice, the spirit to speak in our own discernment, we kept hearing a clearer call into this path with all of you, into this, this way. After all, Jesus himself didn't come to start a new religion but the earliest church called themselves the way, the way. One last description of vocation. The pastor writer Frederick Beekner once defined vocation as the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. The needs of this world, of any community, and then concentric circles out, any town, nation, world, the needs are infinite, right? But there is only one you, each individually, and there is only one you, First Parish in Lincoln. And as we listen for the Spirit to speak, that vision will emerge together, the place where the world's deepest needs meet, not just our goals, but our deep gladness, the gift of who we already are. God is not done with us yet, so have a little cake. Let's take a deep breath. <laughs> it's been a challenging few years in the world, has it not? And the path may wind ahead and it may sometimes be too much. We may need to take some shade under the tree together from time to time. But if we can get still enough to listen to that sound of sheer silence, that still small voice, I trust, we trust, that we will weather the way together with deep gladness. May it be so. Amen. And now will you join me in singing our closing hymn, number 215 in the gray hymnal, Praise to the Living God. Thank you.
friends, Kit and I just wanted to express our thanks for all the hospitality we have received uh, over this candidating week and to acknowledge all the work that's gone on behind the scenes in making today such a special Sunday. So now as we prepare to go forth to continue the work of this church, let us remember to listen for that still small voice that calls us, that surprises us, that brings us into a deeper relationship with ourselves and with one another. And may you go forth into this day and into this world in peace. May your ears and hearts be wide open for where way may be opening and where that wily spirit may be calling us next. And may the love of God, the persistent, powerful love of all that is eternal, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Now is time for announcements. If there are any announcements from the community at this point, I'll take those first. Good morning, friends. Uh, Rosemary Lloyd on behalf of the Ministerial Internship Supervisory Committee. Okay, she's not here for this announcement, but I wanted to let you know that this week, Sarah Klikowski, who we already see as a minister, met with the regional United Church of Christ Ministerial Committee, and after a thorough investigation of things theological, Greek, administrative, and other, um, the committee voted unanimous, unanimously to accept her into the ordination path in our care. So uh, I hope Sarah is somewhere where she can hear us in, in the other room, and we can congratulate her. Any other community announcements? No? Oh. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Paula. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm your moderator, and we are about to open a very important congregational meeting. If there is any among us who who are not in our membership or who do not want to stay for this um, time, now's the time to leave. Good, you're all here. We have a couple of pieces of business to do before we can move on to the vote. I hope each of you in coming in picked up a ballot. If for some reason you did not, um, as we move to the end of this meeting, please see Tucker Smith who's over there um, and she will um, solve your problem. So, so first, um, well, yeah, first let me say that in addition to those of us who are here, we have a group in the Stearns Room, and James in Normandy is uh, shepherding that on our behalf. And we have you all on Zoom, and I know Sarah is with you, and we'll be doing the voting process uh, for you. So uh, I hope we've got all of that uh, taken care of. In addition, we also have our clerk, who is uh, taking minutes for our men. Uh, meeting, but could not be here because of a 
COVID constraint in her home. Sylvia Perry is our clerk and is with, in, with us from a distance. Now, is Paula here still? Paula was going to lead us in an opening prayer. That would be great, actually. It's so warm outside. I think people might prefer to be here. Apparently, it's going to take us some minutes to get everybody on Zoom who wants to be there. So if you wish to leave, you may. But um, otherwise, we will have some music. And uh, we can sit quietly and be ready when the time comes. So actually, I'd like to have a hymn sing right now where people can suggest their favorite hymns. I think it's, a, a, I, I think it's not too hot to, uh, to keep singing. Um, and so take a look in the gray and the red hymnals, and we'll just have people raise their hands, and we'll just sing until Sarah comes back, and we can have the vote, I think. Um, so if anybody would like to uh, suggest a hymn that they haven't heard for a long time, it can be the most obscure hymn. Anything goes, as long as it's in the red or the gray hymnals. A mighty fortress. A mighty fortress. Which number or which hymnal? Is it the red or the gray? The red. Red and what, what's the number?
many songs does he yeah. want? Yes.
Pod Soup. Is this better? Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> Let us try again. Welcome to everyone. And to settle us into this meeting, we've asked Paula for an opening prayer. God of truth and fruitful outcomes, most gracious and living spirit, we thank you for your presence here today. With anxious and hopeful hearts, we ask for your wisdom and grace as we honor this tradition of calling, listening for what is true for each of us within our deepest self and for what may be your will. May this call be one that strengthens each of us in this faith community, draws us closer to our neighboring communities, and connects us to the wildest, widest world our faith can hold. Amen. Thank you, Paula. And now I believe uh, our parish committee chair has some business for us to conduct before we can vote. My glasses broke, so I'm gonna have to just hold them up like this. <laughs> uh, so, we, first of all, we have a motion uh, on behalf of the parish committee for the first of two votes that we will make uh, today. Um, and the first vote has to do with absentee ballots. Now our uh, bylaws require that voting for a minister, you need 75%, and I'll explain more about that later, but 75% of those present and voting in a special congregational meeting for that purpose. Now we, the parish committee has decided that present means also present on Zoom. So we're, we're just, we, we have decided that, that the people on Zoom are considered to be present for the special meeting. The motion I will make in a moment is to allow us to also count the absentee ballots that have been collected over the last week or so. Um, and the, the rationale for doing that is that with the change in date, the late change in date, there were quite a few members of the congregation that would like to vote including, by the way, two members of the search committee who had made plans to travel the day after the vote, which was to be last Sunday. So we thought it was important that everybody that wanted to vote was able to vote. So the motion I am going to make, or I, I now make, is as follows. First of all, in Article 7 of our bylaws, to strike the word present and, the words present and, and also to add a clause that says to include ballot, absentee balance duly collected by the rules established by the parish committee. This amendment to the bylaws would only pertain to this meeting today. So that's the, um, the, the amendment that the parish committee is offering. I'm, I'm, I've just made a motion, so we need a second. Okay, we, we, well, we need to go and check on the Zoom votes as well to make sure that they have passed as well. There are, I think, around 40 on Zoom, and it's important that everybody's vote be counted. So we'll just, we'll just walk in back and, and make sure that uh, we had a positive vote there. So.
Yes, the motion has passed. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> yes, right. Okay, now, <laughs> Chris, are you making the next one or Sarah is making the next one? All right, Sarah Andresiak and Katie Walker. She's hiking. She's hiking, but she, we dressed alike. So Katie Walker and I, as co-chairs of the search committee, on behalf of the search committee, would like to make a motion that we call Reverend Kit Novotny and Reverend Nate Klug as co-ministers for the First Parish in Lincoln. Do we have a second? Second. second? Discussion. Okay, uh, Chris Andresiak for the uh, Parish Committee. Um, it's my job to just say a little bit about process, meaning what happens in the various uh, possible outcomes here. So, um, our bylaws, there, there's two steps involved in this. It's called a call, but really what it means is that we will call the ministers, or we're gonna vote to call the ministers, and then they have to accept the call. And in kind of non-ministerial language, that means we need to offer them the job and they need to accept the job. All right, so there's a two-step process here. Now, in order for the congregation to offer them the call, to call them, we're gonna vote shortly. And let me tell you what the thresholds are that uh, are relevant here. First of all, um, per our bylaws, we have to have a 75% positive vote in order to call them, meaning <coughs> offer them the position of senior minister. So we need 75% um, to call them. Now, if we do not reach the 75% threshold, here's what would happen. We will go back into an interim period at that point. The parish committee would decide um, whether, well, we, we would need to go appoint another search committee. Um, the parish committee would decide whether we would do that immediately or whether the church would need, say, a year to gather itself before we, we went back into a, another search process. Um, we would also go find another interim minister to guide us during that period. I've spoken to Jenny about this. She has told me that in those cases, the denominations and she would, all, would actually recommend that we find a different interim minister. It would not be Jenny in, in all likelihood. So if we do not get to 75%, that's what we would do is we would move back into an interim period for at least another year or two years. Okay, if we get above 75%, then we will call them, meaning offer them the job. However, the guidance from the denominations and most sort of best practices in the ministerial community is not to accept a call unless you get at least a 90% positive vote. So we would be in that situation if we're between say 75% and 90% where the call would be given but Kit and Nate would need to decide whether to accept with a lower level than say 90%. We would give them that time to make that decision. All right. So that's what would happen if we're between 75 and 90%. If we're, we're above 90%, and 90% or above, then we would expect that they would accept the call right away. And we, will, we would know that very soon, like within a matter of minutes. Yeah, right. Um, and then, they would go through a, a, a period of some meetings and transitional meetings with, with Jenny and the staff over the next few weeks, and then they would start officially on August 1st. So we would have limited contact with them during the summer, some contact, but they really don't start here until August 1st, right? So that's above 90%. So those are kind of the, the rules and the process as regards this. Um, let me make, a, uh, a comment um, about how I would suggest you think about this vote. There is no ministerial candidate or candidates 
that is going to be perfect for every single person in this congregation. We have too much spiritual diversity. We have a range of personal preferences. We would never find somebody that would be perfect for everybody in this room and everybody that's on Zoom and everybody that voted absentee. All right, so the search committee has thought about the congregation as a whole and the basis of their recommendation is on that. So here is, the vote is going to be anonymous. All right, so you should vote your conscience. All right? My suggestion is that you should vote no if you have serious concerns about Kit and Nate's ability to build a healthy ministry for this congregation. If you have serious grave concerns about whether they can build a successful ministry for First Parish in Lincoln. You should vote yes if you think that that is something that they can do and that we can do together, that we can partner with them to build a shared ministry that will be successful for First Parish in Lincoln, even if some small aspect of what they bring to us is not perfect for you. All right, that's my guidance. I'll hand it back to the moderator for additional discussion. Do you have anything to add? Sarah Andrzejczyk for the search committee. And I just would ask all the members of the search committee to rise, Larry Buell, Janet Boynton, hold that for me, Katie, Katie Walker. <laughs> Tom de Normandy is with the candidates, so he can't rise. Heather Ring, and Deanna, Ellen Emma. Larry's standing right over there. All right, have we got everybody? We spent a lot of time together. <laughs> Chris thought it might be helpful to give a sense of how many hours we spent. And I think on, on average, each of us spent at least 10 full-time work weeks, probably more like 20 full-time work weeks on this, each. And that, that's just to say, we've, we've tried to be really diligent. We've worked hard to build on the work of the transition team, to listen to all of the voices in this community, to talk to all kinds of fantastic candidates, and to finally, with great enthusiasm and unanimity, to recommend Reverend Kit and Reverend Nate. Heather likes to say we are out looking for a unicorn, and we found it. I hope that you will all join us in resoundingly voting to call these two ministers. Thank you, Sarah. Is there any other discussion uh, needed here? If not, I think we're probably ready for the vote. You each, as you signed in, received a piece of paper What's gonna happen now, as you leave the, the sanctuary, there will be, I think Tucker and RL will be in the Stern's room. Chris will be out here, I mean, at the sanctuary. Chris will be out here at the Stern's room. Pass in your votes. If it, the, the idea we have is that you're going to be outside milling around while I and um, a couple of others get the votes counted. How, just Apparently, you should eat lunch while you're doing that. If it seems really warm and you wanna wait um, for this voting process to finish, uh, and we hope most of you do, you're certainly welcome to come back in here where it may be cooler than it is outside. We will count the votes. I will then call um, Kit and Nate and tell them the result. They will make a decision on the spot, we certainly hope. Um, and I will um, convey that to you. They will then return. I think somebody's been deputized to ring the bell. 
um, and we will have completed the process. I think I've got that all. Is anybody need to add a wrinkle, Linda? Fifteen minutes. Yeah. There are there are a lot of us, but not so many of us. In fact, it's it's very heartwarming the number of us all who managed in one way or another to be here today. Uh, I think we're well over a hundred, and it's exciting. We haven't seen that many of us together in a very long time. So with that. Um, I am putting a pause, if there's no other question, I'm putting a pause on the meeting. Um, please fill out your votes and turn them in. Let's just assume it. All right, I, I don't hear anything. Try it some profanity and I will go on instantly. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. All right. Oh, <laughs> the purpose of this mic is apparently for the Zoom people and not for you all, so I hope you all can hear me. 100%. A lot of hard work, a lot of, a lot of time, but um, both Kit and Nate were delighted. They're on their way back, um, and we will be able to greet them with enormous enthusiasm. And I guess with thanks to everyone who participated over these past few years in making this happen. It's, it's a great, gonna be a great future for us, and um, what a wonderful day to start it on. So enjoy lunch and be glad. Chris has asked me to say that the kids have voted too. Here are the children. Come, come across the whole thing so we can see it. Yes. Look at this. Oh, yes. <laughs> Congratulations. It's so great to have uh, the support and enthusiasm of our future generation. Yes.
Jennifer. Congratulations. You so if you would like to say something, I would love to say something. Um, in that direction, this works for the people on Zoom. For the okay. other people, you have to shout. We got the camera right here. Okay. Woo! Woo! Yeah. <laughs> you want to come, Zal? <laughs> Well, wow. <laughs> Thank you all so much, and uh, what a wonderful, beautiful way to, to walk back into what is now uh, our church as well as yours, and we're, we're so, so grateful about that. And in, I know we're excited to eat cake soon, but I did just want to say, you know, hearing those bells just reminds me of the amazing history of this place and... I just want to say what an honor and privilege it is to, to be included in that and to have the opportunity to walk forward with you all into the next chapter of First Parish Lincoln. So thank you, thank you. Amen. We are uh, humbled, delighted, excited, and we'll see you in August. But first, Kate, amen. Does that mean you accept? Yes. Oh, right. Small details. We accept with whole hearts and full spirits, and we can't wait to get started. It is our honor to accept. Thank you, and now it's time to eat cake. <laughs> and thank you, kids, for this. Yes. <laughs> it's great. Just great. 